Boundless Spirit, pushing the limits of talk radio with Charlene Springer. I'm Max Christensen, and I'm on Boundless Spirit Radio with Charlene Springer. Welcome to Boundless Spirit Radio with Charlene Springer. And today we have an incredible guest. I can't wait to get information from him and see what he's all about because he does something that I want to know more about. And this is Max Christensen. And um, Max, uh, for those of you who don't know who Max is, <laughs> we're going to have fun knowing who he is today. And he is the uh, creator of Kanlan um, uh, Nigong, I believe it is, um, a technique, a tradition. And um, he runs... He is a traditional Taoist teacher and a teacher of esoterical and alchemical practices. Uh, one of the things that I've always wanted in my life was to go to mystery school. And I felt like I missed it by 10 years because all the people that I know that are at least 10 years older than I am have gone to mystery schools. So we welcome Max Christensen. And I want to hear about mystery schools, Max. <laughs> Well, hello. Thank you for inviting me onto your talk show. Uh, it's kind of a rare opportunity for me because, uh, you know, as you know, I keep kind of secret on these things. But my teacher said it's time to kind of come out a little bit more. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. And we thank your teacher, too. <laughs> so, Max, um, you do Kunlun. It's Kunlun. Uh, and what is that? What is Kunlun? Well, <clears throat> if you look in the old Taoist tradition, there are many... Um, different systems. There is like Mao Shan, there is Long Shan, Tai Shan, different sects of Taoism. And there's a very rare one that's not really talked about is the Kunlun. And uh, what I teach is the Kunlun system, which is composed of many ancient Taoist traditions. And it's the root, basically, Kunlun means the path of no more learning, the top of the mountain, top of the actual physical head. And its main purpose is very secret alchemy that leads to what's called the gold dragon body in the ancient language, which modern Taoists now call the diamond body. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, and again, this is part of what I've always wanted to do, mystery school. And this sounds like, because this is what you're basically teaching, how you're teaching alchemy. Uh, so in your words, what's your definition of alchemy? Well, in our tradition, it's converting basically the body of lead into the body of gold to attain the highest possible manifestation. Um, gold dragon body would be equivalent to the returnable rainbow body of Tibet. The body, um, through a purification, through a practice of letting go and surrendering, it's a water path, a descending of energy, not a, a rising like in Kundalini, the body actually, its physical matter converts from mass into energy and then back into matter again. Hmm. Is this following, um, I, years ago I had, I did have a teacher and um, one of the things that she talked about was that we would be able to basically hold the fullness of our spirit in this physical body. That's what we were kind of leading up to. And this was, you know, quite a few years ago. So do you think we've come to that point? And is this similar? I'm putting it in simple terms, but is this similar to what you, what this um, Kunlun is doing? Well, basically it's to regenerate the body, basically the spirit to what we once originally were before we were in physical form. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we were unlimited potential, you know, unlimited mind beings seeking for something of a more challenge even to go beyond that. And so we come into a physical reality to overcome even the greatest, you know, like where can I go beyond unlimited potential? So we <laughs> come into a physical body in order to experience that. Um, it's to take the human mind to a whole new level that's beyond any form of understanding. And in the legends of China, the eight immortals or the immortals who are in this glowing fabric of light, for a better word, throughout every history and throughout all cultures, they talk about these beings who had this knowledge. 
And so this knowledge was given to specific groups throughout the world, and it was, you know, passed on. But then as time uh, kind of, you know, coalesced, people got more into the egos and that. And what happened is that the knowledge actually started to become more and more hidden to eventually it disappeared and only very few people had it. Mm -hmm. So this is then similar to what the uh, uh, shamans would call the luminous body. Yes. Um, You know, they talk about that when there's a shaman of a true lineage and you need a true lineage to really awaken up the gold dragon body. Um, they will look at you, not physically, but they look at what you're projecting from your source, from the center. And in all shamanic traditions, uh, you know, a lot of the high level shamans never even touch medicine plants. You know, they're, they're naturally we have what's called mind to mind. And mm-hmm. the lineage is transferred at the moment of birth, death of that one shaman. His last breath is blown into the top of the head or the mouth of the other person and he attained that awakening. Mm. So beautiful. I, I've experienced I've experienced some shamanic work, and worked with a particular shaman in Bolivia, well Peru, and um, that blowing into the head it's it it's it feels like it's a download. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's really well, interesting. It's supposed to connect you, in, you know, in the in the center of a human being's body, the source, you know, and we call the middle dantian. There's a it's, quantum science is a vacuum point in the center of the heart, where basically where the heartbeats regulating cells are. Um, it's called the islets of his or is in some traditions. And every shaman and master will try to touch that place. And then they'll open up the channel between the heart and the center of the brain called the crystal palace. And that channel is called Katika channel or channel clarity. And so when they to open the top of the head, like in Tibet, they call Poa, the, the spirit can descend or ascend through that channel. And they can, you know, even like the Tibetan lamas can pick when, where, and how they decide to die by how fast their consciousness is absorbed into that channel. Mm. That is so interesting. And then they do the thing of leaving this diamond behind, this crystal behind. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of people, and say if you took the, the rainbow body, mm-hmm. some, there are different levels. Some, uh, the bio completely dissolves, there's nothing but the le- nails and the hair left. Uh, other traditions in Tibet, you might have like the body may shrink to six inches tall or even one inch tall. And then mm-hmm. they'll encase that usually in gold, and, you know, like a statue and put into a stupa. Um, some believe these relics called crystals, you know, you talk about the crystals, mm-hmm. they call it rimsel or relics. Usually after cremation, you'll see these multicolored relics that actually can reproduce. And they're the purified spiritual essence of those masters. Wow, that is incredible. Have you ever seen anything like that? Like yeah. after uh, uh, cremation? Yeah, well, I have in my room, I have a, a Tibetan altar room, and I have relics of over 200 rainbow body masters, and Guru Rinpoche, who left nothing behind, he was the founder, you know, of Tibetan Buddhism. i got Sakamuni Buddhas. I've got many masters' relics that are left behind from cremation, and also those found in caves, they call terma or treasures, that are found in these caves left by the High Lamas centuries ago. Mm-hmm. How did this path begin for you? I mean, how did you just wake up one day and say, okay, I'm going to, you know, look at Taoism and decide no, that this is what I want to do? No, actually, you know, I was, re- when I was raised back in the 60s, I was very, very unhealthy. I had a, a heart that was two times as big. The valves didn't work. I had very bad breathing problems. And my caretaker actually was a Wudang Taoist back in 1967 who, when my father was, you know, stationed overseas, he was a caretaker for children, and he kind of took care of me. And that's how I got on the path. Mm, your teacher came to you early. <laughs> yeah, you know, he said it was destiny, and, um, you know, I learned Qigong and Neigong and different things to make me healthy again, where medicine, regular Western medicine, had no effect. Mm-hmm. I mean, the doctor said to your mom, well, you know, you might as well dig you know, another grave like your two sons before you because he won't live that long. And then this old master said, well, you have a choice, live or die. You know, everybody has a choice. So um, at that at that young, you know, when you can't breathe and you're unhealthy, you can't do what other kids do, you know, you want to, you know, you want to live. So he taught me secrets, which I didn't understand at that time what these things were until later in life where I can really understand it uh, from a, a scholarly viewpoint what it was. 
Mm -hmm. And you mentioned um, dig graves like the ones before you? Yeah, I had two brothers who died of, um, of the same type of sickness. They didn't survive birth. Um, and so, you know, that was just, you know, genetics, of course. But then later on, you know, after I learned from my master, when I got formally accepted at nine, I actually was up in the, uh, Michigan, we call Lake Marguerite, up in Grayling, Michigan, during the thunder season. And I didn't know that my teachers also were very, very skilled at Mongolian um, shamanism from the Darhad tradition of Inner Mongolia. And uh, I was doing a thunder practice, thunder breathing is called. And I actually got hit by lightning and that was the starting of my whole life. <laughs> and what, what was that sensation like? I mean, what, how do, what do you do when you get hit by lightning? What happens? Well, I was over, you know, a Lake Marguerite and, you know, as a young boy, you're nine years old and you got quite a vivid imagination. And my teachers were in the cabin and uh, I was watching this thunderstorm over the lake and I had a fish pole and you know how you're young, you read comic books and I was reading, of course, Thor. And so I climbed up in a tree and I, you know, over the water and I was doing this very heavy thunder breathing, which my teachers warned me never I should do in a storm, but I didn't listen. And then I got scared by the lightning. I went down and I was on this rock at the edge of the water and I held my fishing pole up and I was doing the breathing and I felt very strange for the first time in my life. And I felt very strong. So I kept doing it. And the next thing I knew was a flash of white light. And uh, from above me, I thought it was three feet above me. And it was this red, kind of a burning orange flash. And uh, all I remember is I fell back into the air in slow motion, didn't hear or feel anything. And my, I was holding my fish pole. And have you ever seen those 1970s fiber optic lamps? Wait. <laughs> And the lightning had gone through me, and my teacher knew something was up and went out looking for me. And it took me about a good two weeks to recover. Uh, but then after that, my sky eye, you know, the upper dante and the wisdom eye, as we call it, was blown open. And it didn't close for over 30 years. Whoa. But isn't that a lot, though, to have that open that you see, sense, feel everything? Well, you know, I always knew when I was young that there was something that wasn't quite right with the world, you could say. <laughs> but it, it, there was something that was missing. And I, I had that, that want to learn. Even when I was young, you know, the first thing yeah, that came to my mind is why do things die? I know that this was not right because pure energy could not die. And so I started my search with my teacher and the next thing, you know, through my life after, you know, they, he left in 1979, uh, I went into Tibetan Buddhism, the Nyingma and the Taoist traditions of Mao Shan, Hawaiian. I went to move to Hawaii and uh, one of my uncles was a kahuna of the Peliku and Kanu tradition. Um, and then uh, the shamanism, I got uh, accepted by the Ainu tradition of northern Japan. Mm. Um, and they saw I was a, a reincarnated uh, high sh a shaman of theirs. So they made me a, a very special role. The last shaman of their tradition gave me the name River Mantarami means he who is touched by wind. And then the Navajo teachers came to me. And then, you know, uh, again, uh, uh, the inner Mongolian tradition, the Darhad is my heart. You know, that's where my whole life changed from. And so now I had students who went to Mongolia and I was actually, they said I was recognized by them as the last Darhad shaman who knew the complete teachings. And they saw my spirit behind my students. Wow. So now you say you're the last. Um, do you plan to leave this to anyone? Well, I have um, a student in Japan I've been teaching and my wife. Um, we're making a Mongolian study center where I live um, mm -hmm. slowly. And so... Um, I just get a lot of shaman will come to see me. Uh, a lot of uh, students in Japan will come and they're, they're um, we call um, uh, priests, will recognize me from way in the past, from like the Tiendai and different traditions. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very interesting, you know, and I'll kind of laugh about it. Uh, but I think it's because they see this gold dragon light. And I have, um, you know, a few people who transmit the Kunlun is my wife and Khan. Sasaki, who is my main student in Japan, and he's studied by scientists because he had attained many sea days or, attained, or spiritual attainments from the Kunlun in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. Because haven't you noticed that uh, 
let's say from what you, we had to experience 10 years ago, things were much longer. You'd have to go through um, a series and it would take years, 10 years to do a particular city, et cetera. And whereas now everything is available in a shorter space of time. Have you noticed that? Yes, well, time is in a way condensing. We now say we're going into timeless time, and even the Mongolians will say that, that the human beings are more spatial than linear. So going beyond time, they're able to accept and learn things at a much more quicker rate. Uh, you know, what took me, say, back in the 60s, took me 10 years to get. Well, now it takes the people maybe three years or one year to get based on how open they are, how childlike, how more simplistic they are, and how playful. You know, it's not like the old days where you're really, really strict, because in the water path, it's surrendering, it's being playful. Because 98% of the Earth's mystery schools are fire path, kundalini based, but you never hear of the water path. Very, very rarely do you do, because it's still an oral tradition. Still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, because, you know, the, the ancient ways, the water path was the original system, but a lot of those things are more oral tradition, mind to mind, because in the real Kunlun tradition, there were no forms, there were no chakras, or there were no meridians or dantians to learn. It was directly transferred mind to mind through, you know, we call one mind touching the other, where the whole sum of a lineage could be transferred in a moment. And then it would manifest in the body as gifts, as healing abilities or awakenings. Mm, beautiful. Sorry, I love this stuff. Um, so you talked about chakras not being there because now there is a whole, there's a movement uh, for people dissolving to dissolve their chakras. Well, you if, if you look at it in this way, this is kind of the history I was taught by my old masters. Mm -hmm. Is that in the old days when human beings were close with nature, they were completely open and very spatial. And then as they came more into this normal linear world, they started to lose their abilities. And so those brain centers that are fully open, and in our tradition, there are nine gates, nine dormant potentials or vacuum points in the brain that are closed. And so like in Kunlun's system, it gives you this cool running, descending nuclear current, and it goes through from the head to the heart. Then when it goes up to the heart, you combine it with a practice called Red Phoenix that opens the nine dormant parts. Once they open up, they never close again, but each point takes 10 times more energy than the body usually generates. Mm -hmm. And so these masters in the past were that connected and that much energy. But then as we got more into the outer world, those pathways closed because we went from the spirit world and emanated into the physical body. But now we're going from physical body into the internal. And so those chakras to us, what they are, is that when those dormant parts of those brains open, that vacuum point releases energy and it travels in all directions through the neurons. And so the mind perceives it as like a flower. But then as above, so below, the body being a lower manifestations of the mind's positive native experiences, will see that chakra for a better word in that part of the body. But if you realize everything is mind, we call mind mirroring, you're seeing your own mind reflected in the body. And so the, the old masters only went from the heart above so that the body would dissolve more easily. So you wouldn't be locked by the limitations of the physical and the linear world itself. Again, this is the ancient way that went back to the third century. But again, a lot of it's an oral tradition, and a lot of that stuff was lost. So later came the fire path, which they kind of rediscovered what they already had. And the fire path works from the lower um, chakras up. Yes. And we work from, you know, the, the middle of the skull, we call the crystal palace, down to the Katika channel. It goes down from there, down into the heart. And the heart is the source of all things. And so then you don't have to deal with those other manifestations, which takes a long time. You know, and if we're householders and we have job and work and children, <laughs> it's very, very hard to get awakening. But Kunlun, we say there's no difference between the, the, the mundane world and the spiritual. It's all mind. We look at it as the mundane world as a spiritual event, and we see a spiritual event 
as a mundane thing so that we dissolve polarity. So the real secret of the ancient, ancient masters would tell you is simply get rid of the mind of polarity, be in the middle, you know, in the center, in this heart, in the, we call where the bliss arises, the wish fulfilling gem. Send that energy out through that channel by feeling and not by visualization. The nine centers of the brain open and the gold dragon body naturally awakens back to what you should be. And how do you do that in this world? Because everyone's busy. <laughs> but see, you can be sweeping the floor, going to the restroom, taking a walk, you know, watching the telly, and you can still be propagating your practice. We call living your practice. It's not where you have to sit for hours in a, a full lotus, uh, because the higher reality, the spatial mind, there is no up or down or in or out. There's a posture that we take in Kunlun that simply is like a key, a mechanism to allow the body to let go of the baggage we got since birth. Mm. You say that when you say, I have all of this stuff I was born with that I have to, I have to get rid of. Well, and the old masters say, and even modern masters will tell you that everything you're experiencing now is a, a manifestation, not of your life, but of your parents' stuff that was passed on to you in your lineage that they didn't finish. If one generation won't finish it, the next generation has to. So it's really you're finishing your family stuff and not so much yours. Well, ironically, I've been um, looking at that <laughs> because I figured that there was something. I mean, I looked at the simple example of my mom cutting her finger. Mm -hmm. And um, in the next thing we know, all of us have this her index finger. So all of us don't use our index finger. Right. And we're talking children and grandchildren don't use their index finger. So I literally had to train myself to use an index finger. And she was the one with the cut on one hand, and we do it on both hands. Well, you're all tied by energy, and mm -hmm. by genetics, and by mind. I'll give an example, say you're born with a heart problem. Well, you know, you say, well, what's the cause of this? Well, if you look back in your generation, mom or dad, they had a heart problem, okay? Then you look back again, but maybe grandma or grandpa had it, but it wasn't as bad. But then a lineage before didn't have anything. So you look at that party lineage. Well, okay, grandma had some kind of heart problem. Well, what that comes from is the mind's experience of life, how what it holds, what it releases. So somehow mentally she had an experience, and maybe through the physical, that led her to shut down that part of her heart responsive to that, you know, that trauma. She didn't know how to get rid of it. So it, it manifests as the body regenerates and cells replicate this cellular information is there. So now she dies with it. But now she didn't finish it. The next generation, her daughter has it. Now she has a little bit more of a heart problem. Don't really know, you know what it is. And so she tries to take care of herself physically, but don't know the energetic cause, the mind cause. Now she got, you know, she didn't get rid of it. Her daughter or her son is born, has a big heart problem. But in Quinlan, we say seven generations forward and seven generations back are repaired by if whoever does what they're doing now in Kunlun, they will help their family line both before and after and things to come. So energetic creates physical. Yes. If you want the healing, you've got to heal it in the energetic. Yeah, and it, but all things stem from the mind, the cause of the mind. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, in Kunlun, we don't have to look for anything, which is so simple, like my teachers taught me, is it's an immortal's practice, is that when you're doing Kunlun, you're surrendering to the divine nature in one's center. And then that simply you have what's called the little death. The back will arc eventually, the mouth opens, the eyes look up, the outer breath disappears, and the inner breathing, what the yogis talk about, or skin breathing, takes an effect. The sun and moon channels, for those who do yoga, they collapse. The shishunne, or thrusting channel, opens, which is non-polarity, is fully magnetic potential, and the dormant parts of the brain open. And in that little death, you have a reset. The ego is dissolved. You're, you find out what your path really is, and then you come out of it with a whole new outlook. Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, our ancestors all had this centuries ago, but once we started going into the modern world, we left where we came from, then we forgot. Mm. 
But do you think that, like, I know I get vision dreams. They aren't like normal dreams. It's almost like teachings during the night. Uh, and, you know, they show you time. They show you, uh, like, last night I had one. I still haven't figured it out. It was about a seed, yet the seed was like a flower. Mm -hmm. And it kept looping on you know waking me up looping looping again looping and i'm like okay what's going on yeah. and um so you know you get all these dreams that with depth but it's really hard to uh, i say verbalize it because uh, words are so dense they feel very heavy and you're seeing it but you un and you understand it but you can't put it to words yeah, well, we say that, you know, real truth can't be explained in words. We call crazy wisdom in other traditions. You know, if you can explain it, it's not the truth. If you can only laugh at it, then you know it's the truth. <laughs> Again, crazy wisdom. And a lot of people who don't have teachers, well, their insights may come from dreams. It may come from other sources at a very subtle level. But then eventually, if you don't look for it, we say when you don't grasp it, it comes to you. When you move toward it, it moves away. So in Taoism, we say, in order to go forward, go back. In order to become full, become empty. The do, mm -hmm. have doing. And the dream is, for most people, the most natural gate to go to to find their truths. Mm, beautiful. So now, how can people, I mean, if, if I wanted to learn uh, Kunlun from you, where, how, what would I, how would I go about this? Well, you know, uh, basically we have a site, you know, again, uh, we have classes through the year. And Kunlun, again, it's, it's a, the accumulation of all my ancient knowledge of my teachers from the Taoist tradition. You know, if you study every tradition that exists and you find the root and practice the root, then you'll be able to understand any other system. And I have had scientists, NASA, Los Alamos, UCLA, Russia, Beijing, all study Kunlun for its remarkable results. And the thing is, uh, if you look at our website, it's called primordialalchemist.com. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll, it'll show classes in that. And me and my wife teach, and I teach, you know, people from, come to me from international, from France and Germany. And, you know, it's, it's very extremely simple. And the highest practices usually are, you know, if you have to practice 20 different things, you're not going to have much time to do anything else. And so we live our practice. And a lot of people, if I have a class, maybe say, say 60 people, at least 90% will have some form of awakening in that class mm. because they learn to surrender and be playful again. And then the most miraculous things happen. You know, and anybody who knows the Kunlun, they can tell you all the really fascinating things that happen. Mm -hmm. Why is, um, you always talk about being playful. Why is that so important in all this? Well, it's because if people are already so uptight as it is and, and wound up, you know, on fiery, and they've lost, you know, the reason why they're here. They're fighting, you know, the illusion outside. And so normal people, they're kind of active participants in the, the movie, for a better word. While in Kunlun people, we become inactive observers. We're outside that reality, so it doesn't affect you. you know? And so what happens is that the Kunlun person who practices will find their own power, which is between them and nature. There should be no middle man. You know? you don't, we don't do the guru yoga where you follow somebody or need shakti pot or anything of that sort. You are the source, a human being in Navajo. They say, one day I hope to become a human being. And mm -hmm. that means to be God-like in physical form. And that's just to realize what you already are. A human being is already enlightened and awakened. But other people say you're not. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you do the practice of Kunlun, it's like they come in and they're like the wet dog, right? And they come in and they start to shake all that, that dross and water off. You know, and all of a sudden, wow, you know, things are so different, so simple. And that's what's the crazy wisdom, because you notice in the old masters, they laugh a lot. You know, and to a normal person, they think, well, this person is a little bit crazy, because all he does is laugh. No, that's the crazy wisdom concept, or coyote medicine. They're laughing because they understand the truth. And where's the greatest place to hide the truth? is right in front of a person. In plain sight. Plain sight. It's the only place we don't look, you know? <laughs> we look in books. 
and we look at, at, at seminars and we look at gurus and we make a walk around, a walk about it. It's going to sacred places. And then we get frustrated, can't find the thing we really seek. But then we, we let go and surrender and just say, oh, okay, I'm done doing the, the walk. Then the truth comes. Mm, so and stop we'll looking. Yeah, stop <laughs> looking. Because, you know, nature, Kun Lun, all the ancient schools, where did they start? Nature. Where did you learn all the practices and methods? Nature. The study of the five elements. And if you study especially thunder and lightning, it's got the five elements all together. You know, lightning gives life. It can take it. But within lightning is wind and water and earth and fire. So studying nature, that is where it all comes from. Mm. That's cool. Wow. <laughs> I am. Um, so do you have some upcoming classes uh, yes. with the Yes. 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 Um, we have a, Dan had to write down for me because yeah. <laughs> he's on the computer because I always mess them up. <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah, on um, June, we have Kunlun class in Phoenix on June 3rd and 4th at the Hilton Phoenix airport. And there's a free talk before um, a free talk night at the Storm Wisdom Center at 3375 Shea Boulevard. And that's in Phoenix uh, at 7 to 8 p.m. And they can meet me and I just kind of explain a lot of what the Kremlin does and, you know, what to expect in a class and just, you know, how it compares to other methods. Mm -hmm. And then there's another class is, uh, um, in San Jose on May 20 and 21st at Dulcie Hayes Mansion, it's called. Oh, okay. The two. And again, you can look on the Primordial Alchemist website. You know, it also has the class for the shamanism and um, also Egyptian. I'm from the school of Anubis uh, from Cairo. It's another not too well-known school. Okay, you've done uh, quite a few... Should I call them techniques or practices? So your shamanism one, which you said the school of, what did you do your shamanism well, um, in Japan? No, well, I was, when I, my student, uh, Khan, you know, he's mm -hmm. one of me, so as I said, Khan, uh, you need to go to see these Ainu shaman in Hokkaido, in northern, you know, Japan. And they don't look, they look Siberian. They don't look Japanese. And uh, so he went there. And he searched through the mountains because they're very reclusive. And there's only a few living ones left. Mm. And I asked Khan, will you please ask them for a robe? And the shaman recognized me through Khan without speaking. They did mind to mind. And he said, oh, he's, been, he, he's one of us hundreds of years ago. And I'm the only, I'm the only non uh, Ainu uh, shaman of their tradition. Mm. And they call me Rera Manturami. Rera is the name of the families of the Ainu. And so they made me two robes out of the medicine tree. And so I'm honorarily one of their shamans, one of their, of their elders. Mm -hmm. um, I had experience with the, the, the Navajo and Apache tradition for a short period of time within a house in Mexico with my DA, who is my teacher. Mm -hmm. And then they gave me a name, uh, Red Willow Coyote Standings. And then I've been with the, the Tibetans, too, and, then, and the Hawaiians. But my heart is more, again, the, I, the, uh, the Mongolian way, you know, from the Darhad tradition of Inner Mongolia. And they were more, in my teacher's lineage, were the advisors to the Genghis and Kublai Khan, the Order of the Gold Arrow. And they're also were the protector of Genghis Khan's tomb in the Forbidden Zone in Inner Darhad, in Inner Mongolia. Mm-hmm. Pay attention to that one. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people trying to find his tomb, but the, the Darhad um, in the Forbidden Zone, they don't allow anybody near that area. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what's uh, what's really interesting for me was that with shamanism, it was the only thing that I felt it in my body, and I connected. I felt I connected to spirit. It was the the only thing that ever felt that way. Well, because it's the original, that's the original practice, you could say, that our ancestors were that connected with the ancient ones that gave us the knowledge to awaken. And later on, those became mystery schools. Mm. 
pass mm. on to people. Yeah. Mm. So then, so what would you teach like in a shamanic class? Well, we have um, earth ceremonies, fire, water ceremonies, wolf dance, snake dance, thunder dance, uh, retreats, standing retreats. I, you know, I, I teach the very, very old ways. Mm-hmm. Um, in our ways of shamanizing, the you know, the ancestors come in. Um, you know, Deanna, she's, she's picking up the Mongolian language, you know, when they talk to her pretty well. But mm-hmm. it's a very ancient tradition. And we, we have, I live near the, the forest and uh, where thunder lightning comes down. And so, because my whole land is full of gold, it's, you know, in a gold mining area from a long, long time ago. Mm-hmm. So it tracks lightning, which is part of our tradition, because I'm Thunder and Lightning Clan and Snake Clan in all my traditions, which is the oldest school. And um, when we go out there and do ceremonies, we have all kinds of unique manifestations of that people have taken pictures of. Um, I mean, lightning coming down during the ceremonies. I mean, the, the spirit world concretely showing themselves in a very you know, solid way to people. Mm-hmm. That's what I love about it. Everyone shows up. <laughs> it's, it's a very old way because in the United States, I haven't found anybody who still practices the Darhad way because I think there's only maybe less than 20 families now in all the Mongolia Darhad region and only maybe three or four shamans left. What? It's a dying tradition. Mm. So I'm making the Mongolian center so that I can keep that alive and hopefully bring those masters here before they pass on. Oh, that would be great. That would really be great. And what about in the Egyptian tradition? I don't know. What would the Egyptians do? I don't know enough about that. (laughs) Well, (laughs) it's not what you commonly see out there in these days. Um, In our tradition that I was learned is from the school of, we call it school of Tet for a better word, but it's the school of Anubis or Apu. And they were alchemists. And they do different variations of breath to get what's called the body of Ra. Uh, give an example. When I was there, I went with William Henry to Egypt a few years back and with my wife. And give you an idea, we were in Socorro. And we saw, found one of these doors that led to another world. So I had put my wife into the door and we started doing the breath of Anubis. And what happened, we did not know that we were being followed by the priesthood of Anubis who live out there. And uh, they were following us around and had blue eyes and green eyes and, you know, mottled brown and white face. And she started spinning and then going up into the air a little bit. You know, we didn't do the whole ceremony. And they turned around and goes, why didn't you let her finish it? Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> there, yeah, there was a bunch of German tourists clapping their hands, thought it was part of some show. <laughs> And they actually followed us all the way back to Cairo on the boat, wondering how I got to learn their old ways. And so we went to a Cairo museum and I was reading the glyphs in the old way. You know, reading, there's like the way of the scribe, there's the way of, you know, the priest of reading it. Each glyph can mean something else apart or different than the Egyptologist. Mm -hmm. So I was taking my students around and I was reading them the translations, how I read them. And I didn't know at that time there were three Egyptologists from the Cairo Museum was following me for over an hour and listening to what I was saying. <laughs> well, did you, where'd you learn your Egyptology? We don't read it that way. And he goes, well, you read it probably from the scholars way, but you never read it from this way. He goes, well, we don't know anything about the school of Anubis. It's not allowed to be talked about. And that, I found that quite interesting. And so I said, okay, well, we went to, he said, okay, we'll go to each of these windows and there's these stone carvings says tell me what it says and I'll tell you what it says and so they're telling about the you know the experience of Impotep or whoever it was and the lineage and the life and the great battles and then I said okay read it this way and so well maybe you make it up and goes go to all these glyphs here's the writing here's the word for each one and they went to each one and I just sat there and they came back goes you're absolutely right and we didn't even know that you could read it in this way hmm and so, you know, I teach people how to do the glyphs, how to do the postures, use the, the Ra's of Horus in the right way. Um, it's very fiery. It's very testing. That's what I was just about to say. Isn't this more fire tradition? Well, no, well this is a, 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 a mis- of what people don't understand. Mm-hmm. It is a fire-based system. It's very strong breathing in that. Anything relating with strength breathing is fire. But and people thought, well, in those times, it must have been desert. 
and it was buried and it was, you know, very dry and they surround themselves with fire to get extreme, extreme fire element in them. And then as a balance, the body would create an extreme of water. Mm. But in actuality, Egypt in those times were tropical. It was green, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because north was south and south was north. If you read the old, old glyphs, you know, you got the Dead Sea, you got Cairo, and then you go south. Well, the River Nile also represented the spine. You know, when the Nile turns red, you know, you're talking about what well, was the spinal cord. And the tailbone was actually, was, you know, um, was near the Dead Sea, what would represent near your tailbone. You know, Saquara, you know, uh, the, the Impotent's main pyramid, well, that was your tailbone. Then it went up, you know, up into the head. And, but what they don't tell you is that, well, there's many, many worlds before that. You know, for example, what you told about the Sphinx. Well, the Sphinx was the face of one of the pharaohs who wanted to make himself the one god. Well, it was actually was Anubis. His face was chiseled off. Mm. You know, telling the school of Anubis that how did, you know, the, the pharaoh didn't have much power. It was the priesthood of Anubis. And what they did is that when the people went to pray between the paws of Anubis, they'd whisper, they'd put their hands on his chest, and they'd whisper. And all of a sudden, they would hear a voice talking to them. And they thought, who? It was Anubis speaking to them. But the Sphinx was actually hollow. The, the priest would walk inside there and then listen to the people and then whisper to the people. And they, <laughs> you see, <laughs> one of the things of the school of Anubis. That makes yeah. sense now. <laughs> the burial rites of Anubis, and you know, there was many fascinating things, you know. Uh, but again, I haven't found anybody except when I met them, you know, when they bounced into us in Sakura, except for one other um, uh, experience is that when my friend, he was a lawyer who had a tea house, he's closing in, in Cal Cal oh, sorry, uh, California. Mm -hmm. And so we're sitting there and we're drinking the inventory, and we're kind of tea happy, so too much caffeine. And there was a knock at the door and they opened up and those two Egyptians came in and they lifted their right hand. And I recognized that. And I did the same thing because the priests of Anubis have very long fingers. Mm. And then they, they came and says, we're from Cairo. And they saw us in a dream. They knocked on the door and they said, you know, it was destiny. And we, we talked with tea over tea. And then they showed us like the signs, you know, that they look for in the priests of Anubis and all of these really fascinating things. So the lawyer actually, you know, he quit, you know, his tea house and all that, everything, and he disappeared and studied with that school. <laughs> never, <laughs> never to be heard from again, or? <laughs> uh, you know, because I guess he found his, his calling. Yes, yes, yes. Oh. Yeah, but isn't the Anubis is um, the god of the underworld, no? Yeah, but no, but if you look at the Egyptian gods, Anubis was more, I would say, like the bastard child. You know, he, he held the secret and made all the other gods jealous. He sat on the golden cast. He was mm. the keeper of the secret. And inside that cast, if you open that up, you got the seven plagues of Egypt because you weren't oh. ready. You mm -hmm. were a spy. You were just learning. You weren't a, a, a student, an acolyte. But then if you were an acolyte, you, you opened it, then you got the seven gifts of Egypt, you know, like your seven plagues. Plagues like the seven chakras, the same thing, the river Nile, it's all pretty much the same. But inside the cast was his daughter, Kebahat, representing a black cobra. And so you always mm -hmm. see Anubis in Cairo, you see a statue of Anubis walking side to side with the asp or the black cobra. Death and life work together. Mm -hmm. And then the man, he become a scribe, he learned it, you know, he was a mummy, he was without life when you first entered the school of Anubis. You had no life. Then you became a scribe. And then you became a walker of the path. And then the end result, you became Ra Osiris. You were blessed by the light of Re, which is the light of Am Un Ra, the light before, or Am En Ra, the light after. Mm -hmm. It's a, you won't find this in any book. It's still yeah. an old tradition. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, it comes down to the same thing. It's about no duality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if well, any practice you do, if you can go beyond non-duality, live in your center, and just open that blissful radiant point, and you live that every moment, then awakening is natural. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, the form must eventually become formless. Kundalini means the formless form. 
Because you say go formless and then come back and bring it into this form, this yes. physical form. Yes. Oh. This is only, the body is only a very small amount of you. You know, in our traditions, they say things you see outside yourself, you've mastered. It's the things you haven't seen is what you need to master. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's cool stuff. <laughs> very cool stuff. in depth. No, no, no. This is great because, um, you know, a lot of people don't talk about it. I, I've never heard this much uh, depth on, on Anubis. Well, you know, the reason for this is because a lot of the ancient schools, which are so secretive, don't like it going out to no one who's not of their pure blood. You know, when I gave this knowledge out to the West in the beginning, back in Hawaii, back in the 90s, I started giving this out more. Um a lot of the societies, especially when I was in the Hawaii, the Chinese societies were very unhappy with me teaching these mm -hmm. things, you know, um, because, you know, you had me a pure blood. So that made me kind of inverted banana, you know, white on the outside. <laughs> but, I, but I said to them, these arts will die with you. There's no purpose. All those generations of people will die. For what reason? Then it's going to disappear only to have to be rediscovered hundreds of years ago. And so, yes, I made a lot of enemies teaching this, but when they looked later and they saw that it was doing good, they gave me their blessings. Mm -hmm. My masters, you know, they're heads of the government, and they're all Taoist masters, and they're physicists and astronomers. And when I went there to meet my aunties and uncles, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, you know, a white guy <laughs> with all these things in the governmental or Chinese, you know, it really freaks a lot of people out. <laughs> and then they go like, okay, now you know, my aunties and uncles were giving me the best of their knowledge that they had. You know, a lot of my aunties and uncles, you know, that I met over there, they took me to meet masters that nobody would ever get to know, like ancient masters who are still alive. You know, and a lot of the people in the West would not believe about the Taoist immortals. But I took a, a group of maybe eight students with me one day, and they we went to a place, and I met this Chinese fella who's 90 years old. He was a, a student of this one master. He goes, here, have this tea. He gave me some tea and uh, at the Dragon Gate School. And um, he said, well, I asked well, from a translator, who taught you? Oh, the guy who taught my father and who taught my grandfather since they were nine you know, or five years old. And so now in your mind, that all really goes, if you're 90, your father <laughs> died at 95 or 80, and your grandfather lived to about 100 and something. Now, that means this teacher has to be what, you know? <laughs> so I got, I got put into this room with this, this translator took me into this room with my, you know, my students and this little translator, and he goes, nobody can understand his language. He's so old. And so I, I was expecting a man with white hair and kind of heavy and, you know, you know, typical immortal. Mm -hmm. This man came in, was sitting on his bed, eyes closed, dark brown skin, black hair, hardly any wrinkles, didn't look over 50. And he opened his eyes, and I was trying to communicate with this master, and I was saying, Sifu, Sifu. You know, that's the only thing I knew really in Chinese. And he opened his eyes and they're all completely black. And what this means is that he's the Tao. He has become the great void. Mm -hmm. And he was a known Taoist immortal from many temples. And he had written scrolls that he was known by these people. And he was over, easily over 350 years old. Mm -hmm. And he was, first thing I said, well, what can I speak about this master who doesn't, we don't know each other's language. He opened his eyes. He looked at me and he goes, you're three days late. <laughs> three days late. I just discovered you in this temple through my auntie. And he yelled at my auntie. He goes, he should have been here three days ago. And I, and he goes, what, is this, what does this mean? He goes, well, why weren't you born in China? Why weren't you born back here? I've been waiting for you. And, you know, he says, you have two or three of the awakenings. You could have had your awakenings if you were a young boy. If you had been born back in China. Mm. And he was very upset. And so he says, you will keep in contact with me once a week by letter after you leave here. And we did a mind to mind. But then we didn't know that the Chinese government did not want this happening because they were looking for him. So he has to jump from temple to temple to hide. Mm -hmm. They don't want that things known anymore. They want to die off. 
And so the government actually got in the way and, you know, started chasing him because they want his secret. Mm. And so I never was able to meet him again, which was extremely unfortunate. Mm. But he's still alive, though. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> He does come around. I, you know, I've had students who's actually seen him during a Kundalini practice. They'll see a, a mist in the room, a kind of a whitish mist board, five feet tall, and they'll rub their eyes thinking, maybe I'm hallucinating, you know, a lot of energy. <laughs> and they look, and this old man walks out with white hair now and a white beard, and he crosses his hands behind his back. It looks like somebody from Tang Dynasty, and introspects him, looks at him, shakes his head, and walks back into the mist and disappears. And within the last, I'd say, six or seven months, I've had four people go through this experience mm. because the membrane between this world and the next is almost non-existent now. Mm -hmm. That's why people are seeing things and awakening so quick. But then they have a hard time to relate with the world because there's nobody for them to relate with or talk to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, other people think you're a little bit crazy, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yes, yes. So this is a big part of how we can regenerate this physical form also? Yes. Um, I have, you know, my, a lot of people know about my past. I've been documented pretty much. People actually want me to write a book on the, the, the benefits of this healing. I've had the Army did a, uh, in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, many years ago, they did CAT scans on me and chemical scans. And the scientists were there from UCLA again, from NASA, Los Alamos. UCLA wanted me to do two-week tests. I said no. And Russia. And they did all kinds of tests, and they were quite amazed what they found. And then my history was something also, because I've been impaled all the way through the chest and survived that with a piece of rebar in a car accident, hit by a car a few times, bit by cobra, bit by rattlesnake, pronounced dead, survived that three hours. My heart stopped twice. Um, <laughs> you name it. And uh, <laughs> see the Kunlun, it was designed in, in a place called Kunlun Mountain, the land of snow, only energy and snow, not so much, it's very barren. And they learned, these great masters learned how to use this energy to regenerate the body. And what's very unique is that the colder your environment is when you're injured, the faster you regenerate. Mm. I was playing sword with one of my students one time in Hawaii. Uh, I used razor sharp swords and I was kind of, my mind slipped for a moment and I flipped the sword over in from his hand and it cut my femoral artery right Ooh. in my calf, is, right, right into the bone. Ooh. I was feeling very blissful. I was wearing black, you know, pants. I was teaching martial art and I didn't feel it. I was feeling, wow, I am so blissful, you know, and I was feeling very happy. And my students were there and were like, what's all this red paint all over the grass? And I know that I severed the artery completely. And so um, I was kind of feeling good and people came over and I kind of sealed my artery and says, get back to work, get back to practicing. And I actually, it's, there's a way that we can press these points to seal it for a period of time. But it repaired itself very, very quickly. And then, you know, uh, my, my parents at the time, my family, they were Chinese doctors. So they looked at it and said, wow, it's funny because even though you, you cut the artery in half, it came back together. And so we went and get it checked anyway. And Doc says, we don't have to sew it up, you know? And so it's really amazing what this practice can do. You know, health wise, you don't age as much as your friends do. It slows the aging process. And you always feel like you're a young guy, you know, or a young girl, right? You're full of energy and you really enjoy life. You really start to see what's here. Hmm. How do you think or how do you think the practice affects this? Like, what does regeneration look like? I mean, well, what's mean, happening in this process? Well, if you take, say, a normal person, uh, let's say as a human being, when you're in the, uh, the womb, you look like a curved embryo. And then as you're, you're born, you straighten up. But then as we were before, we become later. Mm -hmm. Then we get older, the back curves, just like an old person does. How we begin is how we end. Now, what happens? A person's longevity is based on the kidney strength. Mm. The kidneys get weak, the water element, the legs get weak, the eyes get weak, and the back gets weak. And then our belly starts to get big. The heart beats fast. The breathing gets fast. We call the destruction of the five elements. 
Now, in Kundalun, the first thing you notice is the kidneys start to regenerate. In the class, they feel like, wow, I feel so good. And then the adrenal glands activate. The mm -hmm. thymus, parathyroids, the endocrine system starts getting booted up and repaired. And so they notice, like, I feel younger. My gray hair starts disappearing. My body's tone is getting better. You know, and that's one of the nicer things. And then, the, and then they notice that the bone marrow, and the scientists have found this out, that, you know, when you get older, it gets this yellow fat and the bones get brittle. Mm -hmm. but then in Kundalun, you're going to get very, very hot. We call the body of the red phoenix, hot outside, cold inside, or vice versa. And what happens is that heat burns out the yellow fat. So all there is left is a red, red, rich bone marrow. And then you get that strength back. Your immune system goes up. You see what I mean? So it's the first thing is like an immortal practice of Tao. All Tao is giving you that immortal practice, but some just go to a certain level. Ours is, is to regenerate. It's like the like um, an alchemy, salt, sulfur, and mercury. Mm -hmm. If the glands are like that, you use the internal alchemy of the glands to regenerate. Because they always say that, that everything we need to keep ourselves alive, it's in our body. Yes. So it's just no one has the key. Yeah. So apparently you have the key. You just need the right method that's, remember, you know, a lot of New Age people, they're trying to find something that works. To me, New Age is a, a lot of old stuff put together. Like, yep. <laughs> if you get too many mixes in the soup, the soup turns bad. For those people out there who listen to this, I don't downplay the New Age. You know, everybody needs some, to find something. Where can we find the real knowledge these days? It's hard. But if you can find somebody who has an authentic knowledge, an authentic lineage of masters who attained it, yeah, they attained the highest levels, then that's, the, that's what you need to practice. And, you know, it's find the root of a system that works for you. That's important. And then living your art, you know, hour here, hour there is not living your art. You must live it and breathe it, you know, from the moment you wake up to the moment you sleep. That's what you're here for. Who am I? Discover who you are. And with the right means, Kundalini works for anybody. 90-year-old, you know, young. Uh, some schools say, well, if you're missing a leg or arm, you can't get awakening. Mm -hmm. Well, energetically, you're perfect. Okay, just because a tree has a broken limb doesn't mean you can't, the tree's not going to grow, right? Of course it'll grow. It's we're going from inside out. There are many stories of Tibet of ancient masters who lost an arm or leg, but it regenerated. Your 99.9% .9 airspace trapped in the magnetic field generated by your mind. You take those, 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 those molecules, those atoms, and you can coalesce it. If you slow down the speed of light, it goes into matter, basically, and go dragon body, matter going higher to the speed of light. You know, you go back to your original set. You know, everything is mind. Everything in mind is energy. Energy is light. You know, don't get stuck on the physical level. You're already awakened. If you live the way you want to be, if you see yourself already awake, not saying one day I will get, that's an if and but maybe, you mm -hmm. do not. See yourself already awake. Live it like you have it without an ego, being humble, and then the cells replicate with that, that concept in your DNA, that mindset. This is what I am. Then it happened. Mm. You speak a lot about lineage. Uh, um, so, you know, people always ask, well, I'm not Chinese or I'm not Japanese or I'm not, you know, Native American. So how do I fit into this process? Yeah. The line, to me, lineage doesn't mean race or color. If I tore off everybody's skin, you couldn't see a difference of color. <laughs> you know? What it is, is, to me, lineage is human being. Okay? Black, white, red. No system is better than another. No person is better than another. We're all in the same boat. We're at the same level. We're just not knowing where we stand in the bigger things. But just, you know, my teacher now says, just acknowledging that you are a human being is enough that will get you awakening if you have the right method. Human being is lineage. Where do we come from? You know, of course, we're born of earth. But then you got to know where do we really come from? You know, we were at the highest level of evolution 
in a spatial reality, and we decided to come to the lowest level to really put ourselves into some lime limitation to really see how we can go beyond what we thought was as far as we can go. Expansion. Yes. <laughs> Without expansion, there's no growth. Without a challenge. People say, well, oh, I got so many bad things happen to me. Limitations or those experiences are, are successes just ready to be acknowledged. Don't look at anything as inherently good or bad. That's polarity. Everything is a potential of learning, non-attachment, non-grasping to these things. You know, it's not the good things that make you move forward if you're in a polarity thinking. It's the things of limitation, the things that we haven't experienced that moves you forward. What if you as an involved human being had nothing to give you a challenge? Would you grow anymore? You wouldn't. Mm -hmm. So the higher we are very evolved, evolved high beings. Masters of manifestation before we come here. But if we mastered manifestation, what more is there, we ask ourselves. So we put ourselves into this reality in order to find ourselves more beyond that. Mm. We picked it. We weren't forced to come here. We picked it. And so a person dies off, so well, he didn't have enough time to finish. Well, maybe he did or she did. But then what happens in all traditions, 49 days, you come back and do it again. <laughs> what else are you going to do? There's no such thing as time we have forever. Yeah, and it doesn't end. You talk a lot about destination, about it being not a thing. Right. Think about it. Where is there to go? You know, my, you know what? I found a really interesting experience that the Kundalini that I teach, one of the, I found a Tibetan tradition, I can't recommend, I can't say the name because I don't want to step on fingers, is that they have it at the end of their complete training to the Tulkus, the reincarnates, or the high lamas were allowed to learn this. And I asked one lama one day, what do you, and when I was in Nepal, and I go to this lama, he goes, what do you lamas do after here? Where is your destination after you've mastered Rainbow Bug? Well, he goes, well, we pick one of 13 star systems to go and teach. Human beings are here to become teachers for out there when we finish, based on what multiverse again you're picking. Hmm. Beautiful. Um, wow. Okay, so people can get more information on your website, www.primordialalchemist.com. And you have this, um, you have a, a, an intensive, a workshop coming up in Phoenix. Do you want to give us the dates again on that, please? Okay, yes. Uh, Phoenix is June 3rd and 4th at the Hilton Phoenix Airport. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess the night before, uh, Friday would be a, a free talk night, so people can see me, you know, at the Storm Wisdom Center at 3375 Shea Boulevard. That's in Phoenix. And you have one in San Jose also. Yeah, that's May 20 and 21st at uh, Dulce Hayes Mansion mm -hmm. from 10 to 2. Yeah. Are you planning any more um, workshops here on the East Coast? Um, well, <laughs> I'm not very good on airplanes. <laughs> I am a terrible flyer. You know, uh, I just don't like heights. Um, so most of the time... I'm Didn't like, you live on a mountain for two years? <laughs> yeah, well, well, mountain's different. You know, you're on the ground. You know, when I developed the Quinlan system, I had so many things from many of my masters. I said, how can I teach all this? So for two years in Taos, New Mexico, I sat in retreat, on a, a silent retreat for two whole years on a mountain with mm. and This little cat that I found dying under a cactus tree. And I lived in this tent, and um, my students would come, you know, <laughs> bring me food once in a while if they didn't forget. Mm -hmm. And 98% of the things I was taught, I threw away because it was dogma. It wasted time. It wasn't the root that goes to the point to give awakening. And I have found through this experience that anybody, regardless of belief, if they're open-hearted and open-minded and not scary and don't have an ego, that they will have great openings very, very quickly. But I always tell them, a gift can be a burden. Once you start on a true path, you must complete the path. So we don't have a choice. <laughs> You've got a choice, but eventually everything that happens in our life is to lead us in some way to a spiritual path. Yes. 
But do you want to spend your time on a path? Like, give you an idea. And when I was teaching in Sedona, one class I had, um, <laughs> that's a funny place. And so I tell <laughs> people, in the Kunlun path, there are two doors. And your path, you must be humble if you're a teacher and open-minded. You must empty your cup. And so I said, <laughs> it's the first time I taught in Sedona, and probably the last. <laughs> two doors on this path. The one that leads here and the one that leads out the door. Mm. If you're not willing to open your mind to a great possibility, because your teachers think that you know everything, there's unlimited potential of knowledge. And mm. 90% were where their students were, were, were teachers uh, from uh, Sedona with yeah. their and tantric, you know, so so people. Yeah. And I had, I think, only three or four people who stayed out of 30. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't realize because I'm very direct. You know, if you're going to spend your time, make sure it's a working system that has a lineage, it's been proven, and don't listen to what the teacher says. Talk to the people who've been learning for a while. Get the student's experience who's learned it. Mm. You know, I kicked a lot out who are kind of egotistical and mean and use it for bad purpose, and then they go to other people and they talk very bad about the Kunlun, you know, because I wouldn't give them what they wanted. You know, the fame and the fortune. I said, that's not what it's for. It's for awakening yourself, helping your family, and making this world better. You know, that's, that's a good point to me. Yeah, key points. Key points. Wow, Max. <laughs> this is a lot. Thank you so much for being on with us this first hour. Again, uh, the website, primordialalchemist.com. And, you know, check out the two workshops, the upcoming workshops. And there's so much more information on there, too. There are a couple YouTube videos, etc. So please check it out. And uh, Max, thanks again for being with us on this hour. And we will see you for our next hour, the Woo Woo Hour. Okay. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Great, great, great. So thanks again for listening to Boundless Spirit Radio. And we'll be back with Max Christensen for the Woo Woo Hour. Take care. Boundless Spirit goes off the rails. Next up in our members-only segment, the Woo Woo Hour. Whether it's happening on the planet, off the planet, or inside the planet, host Charlene Springer, expert guests, and you dare to go there in the Woo Woo Hour. Thank you.